Good morning, church. It is Sunday morning. We are here to talk about God's Word for just a little bit. Um, hope that you all are doing well. I want to apologize in advance for animal sounds. I have um, given in to the fact that there is no place in my entire existence at any point in time where there are not animals making noise. And if I were to find that place where animals were, weren't making noise, um, the kids would be making noise. And so noise is just part of the deal. But one of the things that we loved about Fernbell when we first visited was we came that first Sunday and it was during communion and um, Michelle leans over with all of the buzz of the kids and the people tending the kids during communion and she says don't you love that sound and so one of the things that we've always liked is that we are not a quiet family uh, but we embrace the sounds of what God has made and so I'm going to stretch that as far as I can to get through this and uh, use that as a way of eagerly anticipating a time where I can be with you again and take communion with you again in all of its glory. So we're talking about politics and uh, we're talking particularly about the politics of the New Testament because we're at a time in our country's history and our country's life where politics seems to consume everything. And in my office as patients come and go it seems to be one of the only things that people want to talk about. It's all you see on social media, it's all you see on the news. We have this increasing tendency to frame everything in terms of politics and so it's a big part of our life and as those who have been baptized uh, have pledged our allegiance to Jesus in our baptism, as those who have pledged allegiance to Jesus at the table of um, the Lord, we have an obligation, we have obligated ourselves to taking this subject, as with all subjects, um, seriously in an effort to follow Jesus as he gave us an example. And so we started with two basic statements. Uh, we talked about the first one last week. We're going to talk about the second one for a few minutes this week. The first one last week was that Jesus was inescapably political. Um, He's not political in the term, or the way we're used to thinking about politics. He uh, would not be a Republican or a Democrat or an Independent. He would not be a part of the Tea Party. Jesus is not a capitalist or a socialist, but in his context, Jesus was political. He was a king who came announcing his kingdom. Rome saw him as the leader of a political movement. Um, the language he used was political. The early church understood itself as political. And here we're talking about political in the broadest sense, that they saw themselves as embodying an alternative way of being community, an alternative proposal for how humanity and the world might work. Jesus was political. To say, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. To say, love your neighbor as yourself are political statements. But today we have to add the second part to that. We mentioned it last week. We talked about it just a little bit. We want to talk about it a lot more today. Um, the second part of that is that while Jesus was inescapably political, a king with a kingdom, an alternative politic, a way of being humanity and society, he was political in ways that were vastly different than the ways other people were political around him. And um, one of the things that I want to contend with is that if we are inescapably political in the way that Jesus is inescapably political, we will find that we are also radically different than the ways people are political around us. And notice the way I put that. I'm just going to throw this in for free. I just, I've been thinking about where to put this in. It just occur, occurred to me that this is, this is a good spot for it. Um, notice that I said that when we are political, the way Jesus is political. Because sometimes, and the church is especially prone to this in a variety of ways, uh, sometimes we get it in our mind, not without cause, that we ought to be different from the world, and so we go around being disagreeable with the world. And so whatever the world is for, however you want to define the world, whatever particular subject we're talking about, we're against it. 
Um, but that is not the way of the New Testament. The way of the New Testament is rather than trying to be different than the world, we are actually going to try to be like Jesus. And in being like Jesus, we are going to find those differences of their own accord. And we're also, for what it's worth, and we'll come across some of these as we go, we're going to find some similarities. But when we follow Jesus, we're going to discover a way of being political that is radically different um, than the way other people are political around us. And I want to focus for just a minute on that word radically, because I think that helps frame the conversation in a helpful way before we start to talk about the particulars of how Jesus is different. Um, in our culture, we tend to think of radical as something that is far out and that is on the extreme of whatever subject we're talking about. But the word radical actually comes from the word radis, and the word radis actually refers to the root of a thing. And so to say that Jesus is radically different in his politics is to say, uh, no more no less, that at its heart, at its root, Jesus is not promoting some extreme form of politics as we are used to doing politics. So yell a little louder, take a more extreme view, but he is giving us a, a, a way of being community, a way of being human that is at its heart utterly different from the way people are political around us. And so one way we might think about this, let me give you a metaphor, I've given it to you before. I said last week when we talked about this particular facet that my goal was not to convince you to become a Republican or a Democrat or to write your senator or not, or to vote or not, or to be a, a capitalist or, or socialist. I, I don't have any of those agendas in mind. And one of the reasons why is because what you discover when you kind of pull back and you look at the way we do politics in America from a distance you discover that no matter where you fall on those spectrums from Democrat to Republican or from capitalist to socialist conservative to progressive uh, you find that really all of those different positions are nothing more than branches of the same tree and we spend a lot of time fighting about which branch is the best branch up in this tree to climb out on and there are differences between the branches, I want to be fair, and there are some parts of some branches that are objectively better and objectively worse than others, I want to be fair there, but they're all coming from the same root. And Jesus, we will discover, is not so much concerned with um, which is the best branch in this tree that we have climbed up for us to be out on. But rather what he's proposing is that we come down out of that tree and we go up a different tree altogether. That's what it means to be a radically different person as regards politics. And so we're not going to de debate, we're not going to fight about whether the Democrat tree or the Republican tree is the tree or the, ooh, let me say that right, the Democrat limb or the Republican limb is the limb we ought to climb out on or the socialist limb or the capitalist limb or the progressive limb or the conservative limb but rather what we're going to say is that as baptized people as people who gather around the table of the Lord and pledge our allegiance to him with the cup of the covenant and the bread his body broken for us we have been called to an entirely different tree and what we will find is that um, this tree with uh, branches that look like political systems of the world. This is the tree that Jesus is laying the axe to at the root. He's giving us an entirely different way of thinking about politics. And he's saying um, this is how we can move forward as a humanity. Because that's what Jesus was. Ultimately, we can discuss these claims later if you need to. We've discussed them in the past. But Jesus was the true human. Jesus was the one who lived his life in such a way that when God looks down at humanity, he looks at Jesus and says, that's what I'm talking about. Jesus offers us a way to be genuine human community. And so Jesus offers a radically different politic. And at the root, the politics of the world... Um, consist of three basic principles and for sake of time I'm super oversimplifying here this is also a bit of review you've heard this before but at the root Jesus um, or the Bible portrays the the politics of the world in three simple movements 
The first one is uh, the recognition of fear. Um, it is the recognition that there are scary things in the world. This goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. Uh, in Genesis chapter 3, this is where sin, through Adam and Eve, opens the door to death in the world, and death comes marching into God's good creation and begins to undo everything that God has done. And so blessings are replaced by curse, right? Abundance is replaced by scarcity in Genesis chapter 3. Thriving is replaced by, again, that, that scarcity. And so by the end of Genesis chapter 3, there is this uh, pervading, this prevailing anxiety about life now. Eve is now anxious about childbirth. There is a pain, and in the text it's kind of an existential, uh, an emotional, a psychic anxiety about childbirth. Because now she lives in a world where um, the two most common questions we ask when somebody gives birth to a child is one, is mom okay? And two, is the baby okay? Because death now walks free in our world and sometimes moms aren't okay and sometimes babies aren't okay. Adam experiences this anxiety. The earth is fighting back against him. Are we going to have enough to eat? When it says that he will eat his bread by the sweat of his brow, that's not an expression of hard work. In the ancient world, that by the sweat of your brow was an idiom very similar to the way we say, man, he was sweating it, you know. It was wondering if he was going to have enough to eat. And so um, Genesis chapter 3 ushers into God's good creation a, a world that is in many ways fundamentally a scary place. And so fear becomes, in a world controlled by death, one of the major dynamics that we have to deal with. And you will notice that one of the most common statements in the Bible is the command in various places in various contexts, in various articulations, do not be afraid. And when the Bible says do not be afraid, it's not saying don't experience the emotion of fear. Do not deny that there are scary things to talk about. One of the things you'll notice that the Bible never does is the Bible never pretends that things aren't scary. The Bible never pretends that things aren't broken. The Bible pretends that there aren't never pretends that there aren't things to be afraid of, but that command in its various articulations and contexts and situations, do not fear means don't let the scariness or the brokenness or the frightening nature of the world control the way that you do things. Because at the end of the day, moving on from fear, a world in which things are broken and there are scary things, uh, the world using that term as a system, a way of doing business, has taken up a path that addresses fear by letting it control it. So in a broken world, the second move is we see something we're afraid of, and we try to find who's at fault for that. This is the move of accusation. First is fear. Fear leads to accusation in the politics of the world, and so we've got to figure out who the good guys are. We've got to figure out who the bad guys are. And this happens again as early as Genesis chapter 3. As soon as God comes in and finds them hiding in the bush, he says to Adam, who told you that you were naked? And his first move was to point the finger at Eve, at his wife, the woman that you gave me, uh, gave me the fruit and told me to eat it. In the second chapter after this, in Genesis chapter 4, we see that Cain and Abel bring their sacrifices to the Lord. Abel's is accepted. Cain's is uh, not for um, whatever reason, and we can have discussions about that. But Cain, uh, in this moment of anxiety, because his sacrifice has not been accepted by God, uh, lashes out at Abel. You know, Abel's the problem. Uh, Pharaoh in Egypt, in Exodus chapter 1, looks out, having forgotten what Joseph has done for the Egyptians, looks out over the Hebrews and sees that they are growing in numbers, and it says that he's afraid, and um, his solution to that, this is kind of bleeding into number three, is to deal with the Hebrews. So this is the way we do business. In the world, the politics of the world, rooted in fear, 
the nation's going to fall apart. We're not going to have enough jobs. We're not going to have enough food. Somebody's going to attack us. Somebody's going to invade us. Somebody's going to introduce a political system that we're not comfortable with. Somebody's going to change our way of life. These, these fears, these anxieties are met with accusation. I'm afraid that my way of life is going to change or my job is going to be taken out from under me or this disease is going to get me or my rights are going to be impinged on or whatever you want to fill in the blank with with that anxiety and those people over there on that side they're the ones doing it they're the ones at fault they're the ones who are making things bad it's them they're the bad guys we're the good guys and so in a world controlled by fear, the politics of the world builds these walls between us and them. There's the 99% and the 1%, the left and the right, the Democrats and the Republicans, the, the conservatives and the progressives, the capitalists and you know, the socialists, or, or whatever wall you want to put up there. And sometimes there are literal walls. There are those on this side and there are those on the other side. And we're the good guys and they're the bad guys. And we could say some very unsavory things about them. Um, but fear in the politics of the world leads to accusation. And we've talked about this before, but let me just mention it. That, that accusation comes from Satan. Accusation is the fundamentally satanic move. As a matter of fact, the term the Satan, used in the Old Testament and the New Testament both, is, um, is the accuser. He is the accuser. He's the one who points the finger and says, I know you're anxious about this. I know that you think something is broken. I know that something is amiss. And they're the ones to blame. This is what he's doing in Genesis chapter 3 when he suggests that God is holding back on Adam and Eve, that they could have their best life now if only they would throw themselves um, from the strictures and structure of God's way of life. This is what is going on in Exodus chapter 1 as Pharaoh feels this anxiety, this dread, and he says, oh, the Hebrews are to blame. This is what's going on in Revelation 13 when Satan is thrown down and the great angelic voice cries out, um, the accuser of the brethren and sistren who accuses them day and night has been thrown down. And interestingly, in Revelation 13, that word for accusation, he accuses them day and night, is in Greek, kategoreo. It is where we get our English word categorize, to put people in boxes. You're a good guy, you're a good guy, you're a good guy, you're a bad guy. That is the fundamental satanic move. Something is going on in the world, and if we were only to deal with you, if we would only fix you, then everything would be better. And so with fear in place and accusation in place, um, the politics of the world then lean heavily on power. So if something is wrong in the world and you're to blame for it, then I need to do something about you to make things right. Uh, this is again Cain and Abel. Cain in his anxiety looks around and he blames Abel because Abel got it right and Cain got it wrong and so he kills Abel he gets some power over Abel and takes care of his problem of course it doesn't take care of his problem that's part of the point that we're driving here Pharaoh looks out and he feels this anxiety and he blames that anxiety on the growing population of the Hebrews and so he seeks to get power over the Hebrews and so he enacts policies in the sake of national security, domestic policies to enslave the people, to force them to work, and then eventually enacts a national security policy of genocide. Um, this is what happens with both the Jewish leaders and the Roman leaders in Palestine when Jesus is crucified. Jesus was a threat to their way of life. Um, for the Jewish leaders who had made their peace with Rome, who had found some sort of uh, prosperity under the Roman rule by getting along. Jesus was rocking their boat. He threatened their way of life by suggesting that people actually take God seriously. And so their solution was to exert power over him. They enacted a plan to have him crucified and they did that by stoking the fears of Pilate. 
when they went in and said, here is someone who is pretending to be a king, and we have no king but Caesar. They really um, forced Pilate's position because Pilate could not let those sorts of threats go. And so he used the power of the empire to execute. And we do this sort of thing all the time. Anxiety leading to accusation, leading to power. This is our political season. If you listen to it right now, as we lead up to the election, both sides, although they're afraid of different things, they're anxious about different things, both sides are in full-on accusation and power mode. If you let the other side win, then we are going to become a bunch of communists. If you let the other side win, then we're going to become a bunch of fascists. And I'm not debating the legitimacy of either of those positions. Both of those are too simple by far. But this is the narrative that you're getting from a lot of your friends on Facebook. And so the solution is that we need to get more power than those people. We need to get more votes. We need to spend more money. We need to outshout those people. We need to out-legislate those people over there, the bad guys, the ones who are making things wrong. It's both on both sides, although the nuances are different, the same move. It is anxiety leading to accusation, leading to power over. And um, if you stop and you think about it for just a few minutes, you're going to see this everywhere you go. It's in the way that we plan neighborhoods, it's in the way we do city ordinances, it's in the way that we organize schools, it's in the way that we organize churches, it's in the way um, that we advertise. Just listen for that anxiety and accusation and power and you will see that it really does rest at the heart of almost everything we do as a society. We are a society built on anxiety, accusation, and power. And this isn't bashing the United States because we're not alone in this. Going as far back as Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, human community has been built on the rhythms of, the dynamics of anxiety, accusation, and power. This is the way of the world, which is why we say that no matter which limb you climb out on, you're still a part of the same tree. The Democrats are just as invested in anxiety, accusation, and power as the Republicans are. And it's not, again, just an American thing. If you go back to the British Empire, or you go back to Nazi Germany, or you go back to Babylon, or you go back to ancient Israel, or you go to wherever you want to, chances are if you plant yourself at any point in history, you're going to see a society that is dominated by anxiety, accusation, and power. And so to that world, where that's just the way things work. Jesus is going to come into the scenario and he's going to say, let me offer you a different way. Not just a different branch to climb out on up the same tree. And again, some branches are better than others. Some branches are worse than others, but they're all up the same tree. Let me give you a different tree. Let me give you a way of starting from a different root, a different way of looking at this. And that's what we're going to look at next week. Um, I kind of want to go slow with this because I don't want to go too long uh, at any given point, And I want to make sure that we're talking about this uh, as clearly as possible. But Jesus is inescapably political. But the politics of the world are invested in um, fear and accusation and power. And Jesus is going to offer a radically different way. And so dog in the front yard's barking. That's my sign. Stop talking. And so let's pray. Lord, we pray that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts that understand. As so we seek to follow you in our world, to be your kind of humans in this world, we pray that you would teach us your ways and that you would give us the courage to follow. And now we come to you and we pray as a family. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory now and forever. Amen. Let's remember who we are as we get ready to go back out into God's world. We shall love the Lord our God with all our heart, 
with all our soul, with all our mind, and with all our strength. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second commandment is like it, we shall love our neighbor as ourselves. All of the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. We love because God first loved us. Anyone who says that they love God but hates their brother or sister is a liar. How are you going to love God whom you have never seen if you don't love your brother or sister who is right in front of you? So this is the command we have from him. Those who love God must also love their brother and sister. Church, we love you. Have a great week. We can't wait to see you.